Hey there, welcome back to Noob School. We have a special guest today, James McKissick. His friends call him Yummy. That's right. Good sales name, by the way. Uh, James and I have been friends a long time, and, and I know him to be uh, a great salesperson um, through personal dealings with him, uh, through his real estate, uh, and some of the entrepreneurial ventures he's, he's been involved in. So I've known James a long time, and hopefully uh, we'll be able to glean some of his experiences that'll be helpful to the noobs. So, uh, James, welcome aboard. Well, thank you so much, John. I'm, I'm delighted to be here, and I'm thrilled that you asked me. Awesome. Awesome. Yes, so tell us uh, tell us how you got started in sales in the first place. Well, um, I guess uh, my father was an entrepreneur in pretty much every sense of the word. Yeah. And he did. He was into all kinds of different things. Yeah. And he had one of his good friends down at the beach was a man named Jimmy Moore. And Jimmy was just a consummate statesman, politician. Great guy. Yeah. And one of my dad's closest friends in I think my father had to put down his job title somewhere for some position, something that he was doing. And Jimmy Moore found it and it <laughs> said, uh, Foster McKissick, and it said, what's your job title? And he said, sales. Mm. <laughs> and so I knew from an early age, I mean, everything everything involves a sale. Yes. And even Zig Ziglar says that, right? Yes. You know, uh, you know nothing happens without a sale yes. in some way, shape or form. Yeah. And so I, my father, you know, that was just his... His mantra was everything right. that he did, there were sales involved with right. it. And he, he viewed himself as a salesman. So. Right. That's interesting because everything I know about you business-wise, you know, a couple of times you've actually been a salesperson, but but when you're running a business or whatever you're doing, you were always in sales. I could tell, right? You're mm -hmm. always a sales. So I'll tell you, since you brought your dad up, when I was in college, I got paired with him for dinner one night at a mm -hmm. Citadel event. Mm -hmm. And I was a little nervous, you know, because Mr. McKissick was a, you know, probably the most successful business guy in South Carolina. Had, you know, developed beachfront stuff and car dealerships and convenience stores and movie chains and I don't know all that stuff. I didn't know what he wanted to talk about, and so we sit down and kind of I was I was kind of clammed up. I wouldn't say anything, and he goes, "Well, John," I said, "Yeah," he goes. You seen any good movies lately? <laughs> <laughs> he wanted to talk about movies, oh, man. and, and uh, you know that's the salesman. He's not he's not leaving his area that he might be selling something in unless he has to. Right? Why would you? Why, mm -hmm. He don't want to talk about Baltimore Ravens football <laughs> unless he owns the franchise. He's right. promoted movies. That's exactly right. I love it. I just love it. I never forgot that that moment with with your dad. Um. So. When you got out of South Carolina, mm -hmm. did you go right into sales or were you thinking about some other things? Well, right when I got out of undergraduate school at South Carolina, my brother and I had opened a liquor store. That's right. <laughs> Up there on two, off 291, right? That's right. right. Yes. Ferris in 291. Yeah. You know, I, we figured we were so good at drinking liquor, we yeah. could sell it too. <laughs> Didn't Perry have something to do with and that? Perry Keys worked with us for a long time. Wasn't there some like p pilferage? No, Perry, Perry drank a lot of the profits. I mean, we, you know, <laughs> he thought he, you know, he was getting paid in dollars and all he could drink. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't a smorgasbord. Though. Yeah. No, Perry was fabulous. That's great. Yeah, That's sir. great. He's he's great. We're gonna have him on the Noob School soon. I hope. Good. So you, so y'all opened up a liquor store right after college. That's right. Right out of right out of the shoe. So entrepreneurial, just right mm -hmm. off off the get go. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that really I learned so much from from doing that, John, because I, you know, I thought, okay, here we go. You just open a liquor store and people will come, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's the way you do it. Yeah, it's it's a really competitive business, and I learned a lot about sales, and I yeah. learned about how to reach people, and about understanding what their needs are, and yeah. a great deal of it is convenience. But you know, I learned in that instance that a lot of it is price too. Yeah, interesting. Or maybe our customers buying so much that they were price sensitive. I don't know. But yeah, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Um. So price was a big deal. I yeah. I remember asking you back then because I was a customer. I remember asking you, why do so many people buy the small bottles of liquor? Because we just always buy the you know the the handle mm -hmm. or whatever, right? Put it on the bar, and you said. Because a lot of those people would drink it all. That's right. They have to control their drinking by how much they they buy. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah. 
Well, we never would have that problem, would we? No, no, no. no. Not in a million years. No, never. <laughs> um, well, let's talk about um, let's talk about the next thing you did after that. So, after being in that business for a couple of years, I realized, you know, one that that wasn't something that I saw myself in long term, mm -hmm. and it was a great opportunity, and I learned a lot. And unfortunately, it was a painful lesson. It was an expensive lesson, mm -hmm. let's put it that way. But it gave me a lot of practical experience and things that I needed yeah. to, to know. Yeah. And what, even though I'd come out of the university with a business degree. I said, there's a lot I still don't know. And so that prompted me to go back to business school. Okay. And so I went back and got my MBA at Carolina, okay. which was fabulous because I had a couple of years, not only, you know, oftentimes you see people go back to school who have worked for somebody else, mm -hmm. but I was one of the few that had worked for myself mm -hmm. and started a business and come back to yeah. graduate school. Yeah. And I mean, I tell you, that first semester, I think I worked harder and studied more than I did my cumulative four and a half years at Carolina, yeah. just because I was so interested in it and I had practical knowledge that I needed to learn. Interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you'd done that business for what, two, two or three years? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Yeah, right. Um, and what would you say was the, the number one thing you took out of the business school that you learned? Gosh, that's a great question. Um, I think preparation and knowledge uh, were two really good things that I learned out of that. And understanding finance, I, my degree or my MBA was in a concentration of finance. Okay. And I really learned the time value of money. Um, well, you know, managing cash flow at a small business like that is a, is a big deal. Yeah. And you're not worried about, at that time, investing the money and making sure you're getting the maximum utility out of it. You're just worried about making sure that your checks don't bounce on Friday, right, right. when the liquor comes in. Right. Um, that was, uh, but learning the finance end of it and the financial and how money works yeah. and how, really how big money works was mm -hmm. something that was really appealing to me Good. And, and really uh, enlightening, I should say. That's awesome. That's mm -hmm. awesome. Um, did you have like as much social fun then as you did when you were undergraduate? No, no, not at all. <laughs> you just had to work. It was more work. I mean, we got together as a as a class yeah. and did some things. And but you weren't down there at the elbow room. No, no. Okay. Yeah. And my buddy Bo was in law school at the time down there in Columbia, and well, I think we went bowling one time together. But by and large, it was it was study, study, yeah. study. That sounds very different than what you did as an undergrad. <laughs> yeah, sir. Um. Tell us something about sales that you thought was true that turned out to be different. Well, I, I really thought with sales that, you know, you just open the door and you let people know that, hey, I'm here. <laughs> you know, I've got what you need. Come yeah. get it. Yeah. I, I never understood how much work goes into a sale uh -huh. and uh -huh. how much you need to know. And really the psychology behind somebody that's buying something yeah. is just so unbelievably important. Yeah. And, um, Interesting. So you thought that it was more just, you know, we're open for business. You got a fish market, you know, come get your fish or whatever it is. Right. And, and, and the idea of trying to understand their needs, what, what, what their problem is before you really even introduce your product. Right. Yeah. And, and, for, and in fact, when I got out of graduate school, Having talked with you about what I should do at mm -hmm. postgraduate school, um, you introduced me to a fellow named Tom, and I really can't remember his last name. I think he worked for Robinson Humphrey down yeah. in Atlanta. Yeah. And so I went down to Atlanta and I spent the night and I went to I went and met him one morning at six o'clock and yeah. did the morning routine with him and went and sat beside him for yes. a few hours yes. while he worked. And Tom Young. Tom Young. Yeah. That's exactly right. And yeah. he was an investment banker. Yeah. And he was just he was a great guy and he yeah. was killing it and just um, really enjoyed what he did. Yeah. And so I, I thought to myself at that time, I said, you know, that's what I want to do. Mm -hmm. I really and that's why I majored in finance at MBA yeah. school because of that conversation with Interesting. you. Interesting. Um, but when I got to SunTrust and, you know, I was in Atlanta and I was in the capital markets group and I was selling municipal bonds, which is a very specific product. Yeah. And I, you know, there's a finite universe for people to buy municipal bonds. Right. They have, they're tax advantaged for high net worth individuals mm -hmm. and then property and casualty insurers have to buy them and that kind of thing. <laughs> So I thought, okay, here I am, some big shot coming out of Columbia. You know, I'm going to work for SunTrust in Atlanta. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, so my sales manager gives me a list of accounts. He said, we'd like to break into these accounts. I said, okay, great. I'm, I'm your man. Yeah. And it's like, well, what do I do next? Yeah. He goes, we'd like to break into these <laughs> accounts. <laughs> So I, I started picking up the phone and I was calling these New York money managers and, um, 
I would say, hey, this is James. I'm from SunTrust. Mm -hmm. And they're like, who? From mm -hmm. where? Mm -hmm. and James from Atlanta and SunTrust. Click. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? It was really an uphill battle. Just, yeah. And I really learned to appreciate people's time because these guys, I mean, they're under the clock. The money managers, I mean, you know, they've got a finite window to sell their product and trade yeah. municipal securities or whatever yeah. they're doing during yeah. the day. And here I was trying to call them and peak business hours and yeah. introduce my product and service. Yeah. And that didn't work out very well right? until I figured out what I was supposed to be doing. And my sales manager, Tom Chuck, was fabulous. And he really helped me along the way. Yeah. And he said, this is how you do it. And he let me for a couple of weeks just churn and burn on the calls. And, and then he pulled me inside. He said, OK, well, let's try this approach. OK, OK. <laughs> so and that, I think that's a common tactic in, in particularly financial services and probably a lot of sales organizations is they just, they kind of give the noob a really hard thing to do, even mm -hmm. almost impossible. You just say, do this for a while, just to see who's willing to try. And if they're not willing to try, maybe they quit or you run them off or something. And you're just trying to, one more one more uh, way to figure out who's, who's going to be a long-term player. You think maybe... Absolutely. Okay. And that was, you know, it's when one, you had to, even though I'd come out of graduate school and I knew the product, um, really to understand it is different from knowing it in yeah. a contextual sense from a textbook. So what was the, uh, the correct way to do it? You had to build the relationship and figure out what they were looking for. <laughs> Every <laughs> money manager, I know. Every money manager is different. I mean, yeah. I was calling on Northern Trust in Chicago, and yeah. they were buying munis for retired people who lived in Florida or Texas right. or whomever, right. wherever, that had high net worth portfolios, and yeah. they just didn't want to pay taxes. You know, that's a different product than I would sell in lower floaters to a, a guy, you know, on Peachtree Avenue or. You know, going to somebody like Goldman Sachs, who I was trying to break into, and they're, you know, they were the pinnacle at the time. And yeah. that was, you know, if I could have gotten that account, which I ultimately did, yeah. you know, that was a, a really, a, that was a feather in my cap for that bank. Absolutely. And I'm not trying to, I mean, it was just, that was something I was really proud of doing when yeah. I was there. That's great. Mm -hmm. That's great. Well, that, I mean, something you just said so important, and I hope that the noobs don't forget it, is you want to build a relationship the best you can, but then really focus on firing out what is it they need, not mm -hmm. what is it you got. Right. You don't call and say, hey, this is James from SunTrust. I got some three and a quarters that mature in March. You know, they don't care. Mm -hmm. They don't care about any of those three things. Atlanta, SunTrust, James, three and a quarter, none of it. Right. They only care about their little problem. And if, could this guy possibly solve it for me? Yes or no, right? So that, that's a great, it's a great lesson. Great lesson. Um, once you learn that, sales becomes a lot easier. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's absolutely. Good. Um, so then what? Then what happened? <laughs> so then we moved back to Greenville. We started having children yeah. and decided we needed to live in Greenville yeah. and not in Atlanta. Um, and it was, I mean, this was, gosh, 20 years ago. And it yeah. was it was booming then. I yeah. mean, I couldn't live there today. God bless those people who do. Yeah. Um, but so came back to Greenville and um, tried a few different things and ultimately decided I wanted to get in the real estate business. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did. I went to work for the Cliffs communities. Okay. Um, and that was right before the big bust. Yeah. Right before the Great Recession. And I really enjoyed that. And I really enjoyed real estate. And I, one of the things about financial sales or anything that you have to understand really what people are after, number one. But, you know, what is it that's going to meet their need, like you said, and then how can I make this applicable to their life? Mm -hmm. and, and if it's real estate, like luxury real estate, I mean, that's a different animal because I was so used to selling something on a financial basis. Yeah. Okay, you're going to buy this and you're going to get X return yeah. and it's going to, these are the advantages of owning this. When you're selling real estate to somebody who's, you know, coming down here from the Midwest <laughs> and this is a second home that they're going to put $2 million in and yeah. use it four times a year. Mm -hmm. You don't talk about ROI. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You talk about the experiences that you will have yeah. by owning this and yeah. the family time and painting a picture. And I learned how to tell to sell by using stories. Yeah. And it was a complete paradigm shift for me, but I yeah. really enjoyed that. Awesome. That's another piece of your your sales journey was selling that kind of property. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Yeah, the Cliffs is an amazing company. Is it still called the Cliffs? It is. It is. Mm -hmm. it's seven great golf courses mm -hmm. all, up, all around West, you know, around Greenville, Western North Carolina. 
I've met a lot of people um, that have come down here because of the cliffs and ended up settling in Greenville or really like it. So yeah. all thanks to you, James. <laughs> um, what are some of the things, the sales-oriented things that you've done over the years that you'd say to the noobs, hey, this was a good thing I did. This is something I learned. I want to pass it on to you. I would think one of the things that I didn't do in the beginning, which I would love to do over again if, if I could, was I would read as much as I can. Mm. And I would get the knowledge base. Um, that was my buddy Dan. He gave me all kinds of things. I mean, he would give me Zig Ziglar, yeah. Stephen Covey tapes, um, Tony Robbins, I yeah. mean, anything. Yeah. And I really enjoyed those and listened to them frequently mm -hmm. and read the books. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that that had I done that earlier in my career, I, I would have catapulted me a little bit more. Yeah. Um, another thing I would do is have make sure I had more of a process. You know, especially in the beginning, I think I let my feelings get in the way too much. Yeah. And I, you know, the head trash that you talk about yeah. in the Oops book. Yeah. I had plenty of head trash, uh -huh. and especially coming out of SunTrust and. Um, selling to those money managers. I mean, I had if I had two minutes on the phone with them, that was a fabulous call. Yeah, they're just that busy. And so, one of the things when I came back to Greenville, I mean, every much slower pl pace. I really had to train myself to say, okay, this person has more than two minutes, mm -hmm. and I'm not bothering them by calling them. Right. Then you know that's if if you have something that you are passionate about selling and that can help them, yeah. you're doing them a favor. Exactly. It's not you're not you, they're not doing you a favor. If you can help them and they can help you, it's a win-win situation. And yeah. Like Zig Ziglar says, if you can help enough other people get what they want, you'll get what you want. Absolutely. Well, those are great. Those are two great pointers for the noobs that are just starting out. Is is this is the time to set that foundation of knowledge. And most of what you're going to learn about sales has already been learned, mm -hmm. right? I mean, not that you won't figure something else yourself or some clever way to do something, but you can you you don't have to figure it all out. You know, ninety right. percent of it's already right there in these books and tapes and websites or whatever. So, highly recommend people do that. And noobschool.org, mm -hmm. fantastic site. Yeah, I wish that had been around when you were here. And but, psychology books too. I did yes. reading about psychology and why people buy. Yeah, is a good thing as I well. I agree. Um, and the other is just the process. Is mm -hmm. is to have your. We talk about this with some of the other people, but instead of just kind of being, you know, do this, do that, a little bit willy nilly. Um, is to have your your checklist every day, your your twelve things a day you're going to do, no matter whether you had a good day or a bad day, you're going to keep doing the prospecting, keep doing the learning, keep doing the whatever your things are. Mm -hmm. And again, the weird thing about it is they're watching us, James, and you know we both we've done we've done well, we've had a nice business career so far. But we're telling them all the stuff that we wish we'd have done different because it right. would have been so much easier. <laughs> That's right. You know? I mean, it would have been so much easier. So we're, we're trying to help you. All right. Um, so you mentioned head trash. Do you have any uh, – you want to talk about some head trash, things that you, you thought, you know, were true – as you were growing up, but once you kind of got out in the real world, you figured out this isn't this isn't so true. Mm. I think one of the big things was um, I come from a, a my parents were old when I was born, and I had great respect for them. And all of their friends were much older than right. I was, right. and I, I was always deferential and taught to be reverent and right. taught to be respectful right. of my elders. Right. And so when I first started selling, you know, I was just putting them up on a pedestal. Right. And I was down here, right. this lowly, I'm not worthy, yes. and I can't believe you're even taking the time to talk to me. Um, that lack of self-confidence and that, um, that, 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 didn't, that didn't serve me very well. And right. I know you even talk about it in the book when you say, you know, you call people by their first name mm -hmm. and you establish an equal footing right away. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's, you know... We're just two people on this earth doing the best we can, and yeah. um, we're all equal in God's eyes. Yes, so. I, I agree. That's a wonderful head trash for the noobs to remember, and I had the same thing. You know, my mom's from Charleston, right. so it was all this, you know, yes, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, yes, Mrs., so-and-so, and, you know, I, I, I wish I would have figured that out sooner because it was a long time when I was, in my mind, I was lower than they were. Right. And... You know, it's it's just it's first of all, it's just not true. It's just something that we falsely believed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you got to go in there equal and um, equal. You know, have an equal stature. 
with the people you're talking to. That's a good one. That's a really good one. And one of the things I like to do now is, especially if I'm talking to somebody who's really successful, Yeah. and instead of being intimidated by that, I go in saying, how much can I learn from this person? Mm-hmm. Because they have accomplished so much and seen so much. Yeah. What can I glean from them and, and help them at the same time? Yeah. But, you know, instead of going in that scared or yeah. inferior attitude. I'll give you another uh, idea is there's two things you can do there <clears throat> is you can think, what is it that you do that you are better than them at? Mm. Tennis, yeah. right? Probably. You're probably a better tennis player than they are. You're probably a better runner than they are, right? There's mm. probably many other things I can't even think of. And so, you know, I, I try to think of that when I'm talking to someone who might be like, you know, super rich or some big CEO or something. It's right. like, well, you know. You know, we 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 got to check all the boxes here. You know, maybe we're about equal. You know, that's right. I only got to switch places with you. The other is, and I, I I've seen this done a few times, is is that you whatever that thing is that where you kind of own the home court, mm-hmm. is you try to get that person on that court with you. Right. So if you are, and I've got a friend who does this. He's he's out in uh in in, in Seattle. He's great uh, oarsman. So he's like he does the crew and all that kind of stuff. So. He, he just tries to get his people to go, you know, let's go, let's do some crew and some oaring or whatever. So he's like the boss out there. Mm. You know, yeah. no matter who's got, how much money you've got in your pocket, once you get on one of those shells, <laughs> he's the boss. You better listen to him because if not, you're going to fall out of the shell. And it's freezing mm. cold. So he, he tries to get the playing field kind of on his terms. Right. And you could do it with, with tennis. You could do it with golf. You could do it with a lot of things. So. That's a good point. Yeah, that's a good point. So do you have one last piece of advice for the noobs? One last piece of advice. Um, Be diligent with your process and your knowledge. Make sure that you're doing the things that are getting you closer to your goal every day. I remember one time, and I didn't ask you this, but there was somebody that was working with you Mm -hmm. or for you at DataStream, Mm -hmm. and they wanted to take Friday afternoon off to go (laughs) the beach or whatever, yeah. something I probably would have done. Yeah. And you asked that person, you said, well, I mean, you know, that sounds reasonable, but how is that going to help you get to your monthly goal? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's true. That's true. So, well, yeah, I mean, we, we with at that, there's different, there's different situations, but you know, we had, we had a hard drive and fast growing company. We didn't want people like taking off early and, right. you know, all that kind of junk. So, um, so let's do this now. Let's promote yourself a little bit. Tell us what you're doing now and how how you might be able to interface and partner with these these viewers. Well, sure. Thank you. Um, I am. I have what I call professional ADD or business ADD. So I like to do things for a few years and then move on. Yeah. And most recently, I built. I was in the property management business. Mm-hmm. I've always. I've been in real estate since '05 and selling commercial real estate, but um, my finance background, I said, okay, you know, you need residual income, uh, recurring revenue really helps you mm-hmm. get, build wealth. And so I said, property management does that, and especially coming out of the Great Recession, you know, there, there were no real estate sales. And so I built that business up and sold it. And so now I'm doing something completely different. I still do a little real estate, but I'm in the medical waste business. Mm-hmm. And we have uh, been, we have really persevered on that one because working with state regulators, it's 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 a tough permit to obtain. Mm-hmm. And then once you obtain it, it's tough to keep it because the regulatory issues are tough. But anyway. Are they checking you all the time? Absolutely. Yeah, okay. Um, and, and, and a good thing. I mean, we're yeah. dealing with infectious waste. I mean, things that could harm the public. And mm-hmm. um, so they're doing their job and they're doing it very well. But uh, so now what we do is we do medical waste. So okay. we pick up on infectious waste, biohazard stuff from doctor's offices, funeral homes, um, hospitals and the like. And uh, we treat it in our plant. We're one of two in South Carolina that can actually treat medical okay. waste. And we have the largest permit, 25 million pounds. So, so you treat it and then, then what happens to it? Then it goes to the landfill. Okay. And that's per DHEX guidelines. So once you've so, treated it to some degree, to the degree that they say it's okay, then it just goes to the landfill. That's right. Okay. Yeah, it's a very strict process that we have to go through. The autoclave gets up to 285 degrees and treats it for 30 minutes with steam and pressure yeah. and kills all the microbes. And we have a test tube that goes in there to make sure it does that. And then, That's so. well. So what are you trying to do with that business now? 
we're just trying to grow it like crazy. We, we did really well last year. We were up 250%. Nice. And had a good year. Um, and we just, you know, that's, I, they're not, with people aging, medical waste is not going anywhere. Mm. And it's, um, we've got a new technology that we're chasing that'll hopefully be fun. And I can tell you more about that later. But yeah. for right now, we're just blocking and tackling and trying to get new accounts. Um, we're the local guys. And, and really the big player in the market is, is not very nice. And mm. They, they kind of bait and switch you with a low rate, but then they kill you on the ancillary fees. And so we just do a flat rate pricing and, you know, we charge you for what we pick up, period. Yeah. And so our customers like that. It's Good. much more transparent. But, Good. But Good. Eastern Med Waste, uh, we're Eastern. located right here in Greenville. Okay. We serve a South Carolina, North Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. Okay. And um, yes, yeah, so we've got 18, two 18 wheelers running now and six sprinter vans. And, you ever get to drive it? I do. It's good, clean fun. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't driven it out of the parking lot. Well, yet. I know, I know. I, I would like to bring over my grand my grandsons and, and mm. ride around in the truck in the parking lot. There you Can go. We do that. Absolutely. We'd now we're talking. Now we're talking. All right. Well, <laughs> yes, James, um, always mighty proud of you. All the different things you're doing, and your great, wonderful smile and attitude. Mm. Um, we're delighted to have you on the Noob School to help help the noobs out and. Um, we will uh, we'll we'll bring you back you know bring you back soon and get an update on what's going on with with the business and everything else. Well, that would be great. And again, it was a pleasure being here. And thank you. I'm super proud of your book. All and, right, you man. know, a published author here. You well, know, and you're right. You have a lot of knowledge, and you have been very good to counsel me over the years. And I certainly appreciate it. Well, thanks for listening. Sometime. <laughs> thanks, sure. James. Thank you. All right. Hey, it's John here. Thanks for listening today. Please check out noobschool.org. That's my website. That's where we have other videos and content that can help you get started in sales.